Hailing frequencies open, and welcome to Star Trek Discoverage, the live podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about this week's episode of Star Trek Lower Decks. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and there's nothing more Swedish than Bjorn Borg carrying three Borg babies and a baby Bjorn for Borgs. Joining me on the show, as usual, is my co-host. She's also the co-host of the Generations Geek podcast, a more or less family-friendly celebration of geekdom. It's Ella Pearson. Ella, welcome back to Discoverage. Thank you. Good to have you back on. Good, always good to talk to you. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you are going to the Mission Chicago official Star Trek con next year. You know, I have thought about it. No decisions yet. Okay. Are you going? Okay. Yeah, I am uh, pretty much all set to go and looking forward to it. That's I've never awesome. I've never been to the official one, uh, the official Star Trek con in Vegas uh, for the 50th anniversary. That Me they neither. Did, they did that thing where they, you know, they did like little ones in all the different cities, but never made it to Vegas, but now it's in Chicago. That's a little easier trek for me. So I'm definitely going to that one. I feel like I'm still in the position where I feel decently comfortable and vaccinated, but being around a bunch of people, I'm still like, is that allowed? Am I, I allowed yes. to? <laughs> I fully understand. Yeah. Not without a brain mask on for protection. Yeah. What was the last trek? Oh, exactly. <laughs> what was the last trek con that you went to uh, pre-pandemic times? PP. Uh, Birmingham. Or no, it would have been, uh, no, it must have been Shore Leave. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2019. Yeah, yeah, that would have been the last one. Yeah, that would have been the last one that I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, Shore Leave, uh, two years in a row has been virtual, but back next year, hopefully. Fingers crossed. I mean, our last, uh, that was your first Shore Leave, right? The last yeah. one that we both went to? Yeah, I, I wrecked it. And what? Uh, I was going to say off to a great start. <laughs> oh so yeah! So <laughs> if if we can have like a follow up in terms of what we got we up to, last time, yeah, it was great. Killer. Yeah, yeah, it went really well. Uh, and of course, uh, I enjoyed uh, some great seafood in in Maryland. Classic. You gotta. <laughs> I mean, I I you know I can't. I don't partake, but no. everybody else. Okay. All right. <laughs> As I'm a vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> Is the joke for ever, any of the listeners? It was uh, a seedy little crab shack, but the seedier the better. Well, and and that's what they always say about seafood. Yeah, the the sea is right in the name. This is what I hear. Yeah, exactly for sure. <laughs> Uh, this is the part of the show where we talk about the news in the world of Trek, but once more, um, nothing really huge in the uh, Trek world, at least that I've seen recently. Uh, there's something in a, kind of the Trek-adjacent world that I wanted to mention, and that is that J. Michael Straczynski has announced that they are rebooting Babylon 5, and he will be at the helm of that production. Uh, are you a B5 fan? You know, I can't say that I am. I assume I would enjoy it very much, yeah. but I've always been very monogamous with Star Trek in that way. <laughs> yes, that's a good you way know, to put it. You yeah. know, like, really yeah. didn't, it took me, I was in my late teens when I watched Star Wars for the first time, you know, and to know, you know, yeah. I don't have any qualms with other sci-fi, but that's just what my life has always been. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I like that monogamous. I, I'm the same way. And mm -hmm. uh, when it came out, of course, uh, you know, there was other Trek on TV and like DS9 was out. And I kind of made my choice and I kind of stuck with uh, Trek as far as that goes. Although, you know, my friends had the mm -hmm. latitude to watch them both. And so I've seen some of it, mm -hmm. but I haven't really seen all of it. And I don't have uh, the love that a lot of my friends do for the whole thing. But cool thing is it's all remastered and it's on like, I think, HBO Max or some streaming service. So... I've been uh, kind of catching up, and I guess I have to catch up in time now to beat the new episodes that are coming out. And so what are you thinking watching it recently? Um, I like it. Um, I, and it, it gives me that um, – we're so spoiled now with, like, new Star Trek. You know, it's all glitzy and, uh, and glamorous and cinematic. And mm -hmm. you get used to the look of old Trek, you know, like the original series in TNG, and you kind of stop yeah. seeing mm -hmm. how – uh, cheap it is sometimes. <laughs> I mean, they make it look really good. Yes, definitely. But, but they're working on a very TV budget. And so I've, I'm at that point where I'm just now starting to like take what you see on Babylon 5 for granted. The first couple episodes that I really sat down and watched, it was like, oh boy, they didn't have any money to do this. Um, <laughs> but again, they also make do with what they've got. And some of the alien designs and the makeup is is really great. Yeah, I've, I've from... Um... 
just whatever I've seen from other shows of the era. I think sometimes you get a little bit more, you know, Star Trek, I feel like always went for the like human shaped dude in a mask alien. Yeah. Sometimes you get something a yeah. little more, yeah. a little more spicy from the other shows is what I've gathered. I don't know if that's completely correct. That is. Yeah. They reach a little bit. The one thing they bet really hard on is uh, computer effects. Uh, and I don't know if they have, mm-hmm. Um, any miniatures at all, maybe some, but a lot of their space stuff is all CGI, which is ambitious, um, you know, has not, of course, aged well as those effects don't. And so I'm sure that they were going to make um, mm-hmm. uh, a special a special note to uh, try to advance that with, with the reboot. I'm sure it's going to look great. You know, I'm kind of partial to miniatures, but I think it's just like that thing where like nerds like small things. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, like okay. I could really like if I see like a train set, I'm like sick. So yeah. I think it's really yes. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, miniatures, models, Funko Pops. Yeah, we like small things. I think that works. Exactly. My my father recently bought me um my father, the renowned Scott Pearson, he bought me a Funko Pop of the Werner Herzog character from The Mandalorian. <laughs> okay. And I'm not like a Funko Pop person, but the layers of Werner Herzog being in The Mandalorian were already funny enough. And now to own this Funko Pop He's of a, him. a big eye Funko. It's yeah. like, I can barely look at it. I'm like, what is, what is this doing here? Yeah. And he's probably the same size as the child Funko, so the uh, the tables uh, have turned. It's very odd. He's on the shelf with my, my with my uh, thrifted pottery, so you know, place of <laughs> honor for Werner Herzog. Bring me the child, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, we've just seen the eighth episode of the second season of mm-hmm. Star Trek Lower Decks, an episode called I, Excretus, and we're here to talk all about it. But first, as always, a warning. We're setting a course for the Spoiler Zone listeners, so be warned. We're glad you decided to join us. But if you haven't seen the episode, spoilers are incoming. The official synopsis for I, Excretus is, a consultant arrives on the USS Cerritos to run drills that require the Lower Deckers and bridge crew to swap duties. This episode was written by Ann Kim. Kim was an executive story editor on season one of the show, and this is her first Trek script. She worked previously on shows like New Girl and High School Musical, The Musical, The Series, which has the greatest title (gasps) ever. And this episode was directed by Kim... With Olivia Rodrigo. Yes, that's right, yeah. And this episode was directed by Kim Arndt. Arndt has previously directed five episodes of the show, including An Embarrassment of Duplers and Cache on His Eyes Open from this season. There is no star date for this episode given. And here's some facts about the episode. The character that we see uh, in the episode, Sherry Yin Yem, is the second Pandronian to appear in Star Trek. Uh, the first one was, of course, in the Star Trek the Animated Series episode, Bem. And her outfit is nearly identical to the character in Bem. And the title, I, Excretus, the word Excretus, of course, uh, means waste matter or feces. So it's a poop joke. We got a poop joke into the title. Congratulations. Uh, This episode has a a very special guest star in Alice Krieg uh, reprising her role as Borg Queen, which the more I thought about it, the more I was like, huh, okay, that's interesting. Like you get John Delancey, you figure you're going to see him eventually. I wouldn't have thought that Alice Krieg would have come back to do like... Uh, the voice of the Borg Queen, but I think that that, that was kind of cool. I love that though. She's like nobody else. I am the Borg Queen. Yeah, Let right. Me. Forget all. That. I know you just cast another one, but forget that. Uh, yeah, it's me. Yeah, I, I'm the don't Borg worry Queen. about that. I wonder if she does appearances. Have you ever seen her at a con? Uh, no. Yeah, I haven't either. Not that I remember. Sometimes it does pay, you know, on my on my home podcast with my dad, it pays because I can be like, have I ever seen? Was I small? Was I little? <laughs> right. But yeah. Not that I not that I recall. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's, you know, especially with the movies, like guest stars come in, like uh, Christopher Plummer probably never did like a Star Trek con, but like uh, you get uh, recognizable actors. And she's certainly somebody who has done a lot of um, film and done a lot of uh, genre film and like horror and sci-fi and so i thought that was neat that she stopped by and and lended her voice to the uh to the virtual board queen uh this episode also features lauren lapkiss uh as jennifer shrian and uh some of the other uh normal uh paul Shear, of course is in it and uh the regulars uh from the lower decks company what did you think about the episode i excretus 
You know, I think it might be my favorite this season so far. <laughs> you can't say that every time. Uh, okay, all right. It's why? Um, <laughs> Tell I me know. why. I was going to say. I think I said that last. <laughs> did I say that last week. I yes, you've said it every week uh, successively. But uh, tell me why. No, how many weeks in a row? Um, two or two or three at least. Well, it's getting better. That means it's getting better every time. Fair enough. Fair I enough. do think this one. I thought I did. I was giggling. <laughs> um, last week I was lucky enough to have you know I live alone now so last week I was lucky enough my friend was over and was like yeah put it on so that was fun to watch with somebody but this time I was alone still giggling yeah um, yeah you know I think sometimes um, I'm like deceptively simple plots are the best ones if they're like uh, the captain's an ensign the ensign's a captain go right. and I'm like this right. is the best thing ever obviously it's a little more complicated than that but yeah uh I really enjoyed myself. What did you think? I think that it um, it did that th- that thing that I think Lower Decks, when it's running really, really good, does well, which is it takes a, a Trek-ish thing and then it takes like a TV comedy thing and puts them together. And so you've got a very Trek-ish, uh, I think, kind of premise, which is, you know, somebody comes on that we don't know and they're going to evaluate the crew. Like you see that in, you know, coming of age on TNG or are, um, you know, when Jellicoe comes on and he's yelling at everybody and we get an outsider's look at, um, at the crew. And then also the other part, the swap was like, that's like an office plot, right? Like the office, <laughs> like having corporate comes in and says, oh, I've got this uh, team building exercise. And so the bosses are going to act like uh, the workers and the workers are going to act like the bosses. And we see the power dynamic shift. And of course, the lesson mm-hmm. that you're supposed to learn from that is... Well, I guess you guys have it kind of rough, and I guess you, I guess we should respect you guys a little more. And we get that a little bit in this, but it also gets turned totally on its ear when uh, they find out that the uh, the tester herself is corrupt, and so they have to like you know influence her to give them a fair shake. You know what? Nothing's better for team building than a common enemy. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> uniting against a common enemy. Uh, can... It was jokes on you guys. It was in fact all rigged. The rig was rigged. There are no there are no deck discriminations in foxholes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the one thing that I would have um, liked uh, um, to that end is it gets a little mm-hmm. weird at the end because so you know I this this episode exposes something for me that uh, is like something that I think is built both built into the premise of lower decks, but is also kind of um, not a problem but a, a hurdle that lower decks has to jump over, which is. You know, these are characters that are in Starfleet. They're the latest and the greatest, but also they're kind of screw ups, but in a fun, endearing way. And so, can you be like a fun screw up and be in Starfleet still? And this episode doesn't answer that question, but it really like steers into that question by having our characters who obviously are you know, screwing things up every week. That's like why we watch the show. But now somebody's watching them. Uh, do that, and so you know, at the beginning of the episode, they like leave <laughs> four crew members behind, which. I could totally see happening, uh, like leaving your, you know, your the kid you like the least at the pool, um, but but it, it would look really bad on an evaluation. And so we bring out like these holodeck things, and we have the chance for them to do all these simulations, and then we find out that sh- this lady's got a chip on her shoulder, or her head, or her legs, which whichever piece is uh, there at the time. And so the the way that they stop her is like they put her like in bodily harm they put her in danger until they scare her into like letting them cheat which is a little weird and i thought that like the the right solution to that would be they put her in a simulation like everything they do to her is she's just in a holodeck still like they reprogrammed it you know using her you know that's where i thought it was going yeah yeah me too right right up until the end like using her weapon against her i thought would have been like thematically more pleasing but i still like the fact it's got that Mm -hmm. theme where it's like hey, don't tell us what to do. You know, okay, we flunked the tests, but we've got it where it counts. And I think that that's totally in line with like the the sort of feel of the show. I also think it kind of, at the end of it, when I realized that, oh, we're not like tricking her, like this isn't uh, also, you know, a little um, trick is that it kind of shows off what talent the crew does have. Right? Because mm-hmm. they're like, Chris Line Enemy, no problem. Punch a hole through it. Let's full impulse. Let's go. Right. <laughs> a little twirl around a black hole. Yeah. Teamwork. So in the end, 
they did it's kind of you know a little bit more like oh they are capable to a certain extent yeah maybe they drop someone in the black hole but you know that's that's a red shirt so what are you gonna do yeah. classic yeah if there's all those little scenarios that they go through so I, something that i noticed um is that this is kind of a holodeck or, or simulation heavy episode and Last year, for the number eight position, they did Crisis Point, right? So this is kind of them, like, returning to that idea. Almost like um, like Rick and Morty doing their interdimensional cable, like, once a year. It's like a chance for the show to kind of stretch its legs and, and, mm-hmm. and do different stuff. And all the scenarios that they're involved in are, like... Um, you know, Worf wants somebody to kill him. Uh, we're on an old West planet. Uh, we've got to go do the radiation thing in the warp core. Um, we got to do a Star Trek three. You know, we got to steal the Enterprise. And it seemed like they were, and maybe this is just like, you're supposed to just accept this and nobody needs to say it out loud. But like, it seemed like they were being judged by the um, the skills and exploits of other Starfleet officers. And maybe that's not, what they do. Maybe that's not what they're for or the Cerritos does. And so like going off of what you were saying, like they're good at this. They're good at like skidding by the, <laughs> the crystalline entity, you know, or, or uh, yes, mm-hmm. going around the black hole. Like that's what they're really good at. If you ask them to beat the no win scenario or to stop a con like figure, maybe they need to call in another ship who knows, but like asking them to do what they always do, they can do that. No problem. Mm hmm. I also think kind of, you know, Kirk and the gang, their exploits are kind of the sample size. Like, so to you, you have to judge everyone the same, like, baseline. Like, Kirk's just, maybe Kirk's just throwing off the curve. You know, maybe he's sure. that kid. Yeah. Where it's like, you have to judge everybody based on something. I thought, sorry, you said that right away. And I thought right away of, um, I also, I listen to this plane crash podcast. And mm-hmm. when a plane crashes, the FAA has um, a bunch of pilots do simulations with the exact same, like, problems as whatever happened during the um, plane crash. Okay. And then they judge how well the pilots did in the in the real life scenario based on how um, their test pilots did in the simulations. Yeah. Interesting. And so it's like, if you're judging the Cerritos based on how badass Kirk is. Yeah. They're maybe going to crash the simulations. <laughs> yeah. There'd be a huge curve then, I guess like, you know, you could get a hundred percent for somebody who is not uh, one of the most famous Starfleet officers of all time. Like Rutherford <laughs> liked how he's like, I got to go in there. I got to do the radiate. Oh, the door handles hot. Um <laughs> It, in Star Trek 2, it's like you had a, a Vulcan, you know, who he swapped his consciousness to another guy. And then it's also part human, <laughs> part Vulcan and uh, and also can make a dramatic speech after being irradiated. So there's no way he's going to be able to top that. I think Rutherford is my favorite character. <laughs> he's so got in the first season when he's like happy to be here. Like that still cracks me up when I watch that episode. Yeah. He, the idea that. Spock just bit it. The thing burned him, and he was like, "Whatever." And Rutherford's <laughs> like, "Oh, I, got, um, I guess I'll put my boots on my hands." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I um, think that's what I'd be like as a Starfleet officer. <laughs> so I guess I, I guess overall I liked it. Um, it, it. It's one of those things I've mentioned this in past weeks. Like I feel like the more um, kind of conventional TV comedy Laura Dex gets, the more I feel like I can connect mm-hmm. with it. But also there's like some... workplace sitcom. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I feel like, oh, I, I know where we are now. But also I feel like maybe it's losing something, some of the goofy chaos that that a lot of people really like about the show. Like when they try to be more conventional, mm-hmm. they lose that a little bit. And some I think they've had some really solid episodes um, this season. But it's that same thing of like, it isn't just I have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, just playing off the of the tropes of Star Trek. So, I, you know, I don't know. I guess I complained that I wanted a more conventional show. Now I have it. I'm not happy. <laughs> Big surprise. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think a bit of both is good. You know, you get a little bit. I, I would like to see. I think they could get goofier. And I think that it would be fantastic given the format. Um. But I also think, you know, every once a, a good, you know, a good office episode 
office inspired episode of workplace sitcom energy, I think is good. Also, I just think it's hysterical. I still think it's hysterical to have it set in the context of Star Trek. Like I think it'd be it'd be I've I think I've been disappointed by a few episodes this season, but just the still the idea of like oh it's like a workplace comedy, but it's you know, they're sleeping in the hallways. Yeah. Right. And they don't get pesto in the replicator. Yeah. It still just cracks me up. Well, speaking to that idea and maybe some deeper themes, what do you think about the show um, being, if it is, a sort of a a workers' rights narrative, a commentary on the sort of division between the upper and the lower decks? Because that really comes, that comes out sometimes, but it's really at the center of what uh, today's episode is about. You know, what's funny is I've never really thought about it in a serious way like that. I've only ever thought about it as like, oh, that's funny for the bit. But I don't know. I guess thinking about it seriously, I think I would be torn because I like the idea of Starfleet. Obviously, it's um, no organization can be completely without fault or completely perfect or no society can be a complete utopia, you know, in in theory. Um, Right. But I guess part of what I do love about Star Trek is that Starfleet strives to be that perfect organization or like in, in theory is the perfect organ, like, you know, the whole utopia thing. But I also think it's interesting to delve a little bit deeper. Like it's interesting to think like where in reality, where would the ends sleep? Would they have a little hallway moment? Right. You know, it's funny because yeah. it's kind of talking at the thing where it's like, they're not really the military, but they function in a way that, uh, you know, no expert is very easily comparable. And so like, obviously you want like maybe your captains, your bridge officers to have pesto <laughs> and the lower tech crew can only get one slice of pizza at a time. Yeah. The, but I think that <laughs> the comforts of command, yeah, the, the rewards. Exactly. Like you want to have a little bit of, you know, your quarters are cushier. Do the ensigns really need to be sleeping in a hallway? I don't know. It's a smaller ship. Yeah. You know, maybe it plays back into the California class. I, I don't yeah, know. That's yeah. interesting. I'm going to have to think about that more. Honestly. Yeah. And I don't know what, what, I mean, they used to pack them in on these old, old ships. I don't know how, how many the crew members the, the ship has, but if the defiant can give everybody a little, you know, a little stateroom uh, with a bunk mm-hmm. bed, then yeah. uh, they can't get uh, quarters. Um, it's interesting because I, I was, I was just cruising around on Facebook and I saw um, somebody talking about this first season of a card and they said that they liked it, but they were, they they didn't like that they they felt like how did they put it? they felt like um, some of the characters were not like twenty um, fourth or twenty fifth century characters they didn't feel like Federation people they felt like modern people kind of mm. transposed into that environment and I didn't know like what specifically they were referring to but it made me think about the fact that Picard in its own way and in a very shallow kind of way um, tried to introduce. Um, societal problems into it. You know, you've got a yeah. character who is has to go to some other planet to get medical care um, for a pregnancy. You've got a character that's using drugs and, you know, is kind of outside of society. And I, uh, I never respond to things because I don't want to get involved in <laughs> discussions on the internet. But if I... Had, <laughs> the thought that I had was... I like the fact that they're trying to do that, but I wish that... What disappoints me is that they're not going all the way. I think that people who are watching this show want those questions to be asked in the same way that they were asked with episodes like uh, Past Tense, you know, and Far Beyond the Stars. Um, We are even more, I think, and we're trying to find a word that doesn't mean woke, but, you know, we're more woke than ever. And I think that Mm -hmm. we want that from our our socially conscious sci-fi, especially a, a show like Star Trek that has a federation and has solved the problems, but still uses their milieu to explore the kind of problems that we want fixed in our society. And so I think to do that, like you said, there can't be, there's never going to be an organization that doesn't have problems or doesn't have um, divisions in like a caste system. And in the same way, even in a utopia like the Federation, you're never going to have a society that doesn't have people who have fallen through the cracks and has its own problems and things that it needs to, to solve. And so I would like to see, I don't know where it's going to be. Maybe we have a 
new uh, series about a Star Trek social worker or something like that. But like, I would like to see the franchise um, really go in more on things like that. Mm -hmm. I also think you saying that made me feel like, like that's so core to Star Trek. I think that drive to be better. And I think we get the, we get the boldly go a lot. We get the exploration bit a lot, but you know, the Federation is about improving life and yeah. Yeah. quality of life. And so I don't think, I mean, I don't really think a utopia is possible. I think things can always be better than they are, but it's very Star Trek to like continue to strive for that. Yeah. It's also very Star Trek to make the uh, a bureaucrat the bad guy, uh, as we get in this episode <laughs> with the tester uh, Shira Yen Yem, played by the wonderful uh, Lennon Parham, who plays. Um, I remember her as she was Karen on on Veep and uh, has done a lot of uh, comedic roles. Oh, um, and just putting her in that situation where uh, I, I have no power other than the power to like make or break you, even though you're doing the real work, mm -hmm. and so. I'm going to be uh, that person that gives you a problem. That's a very, we've seen that since, mm -hmm. the, you know, the original series. Yeah. There's always some bureaucrat t trying to tell Kirk what to do. He doesn't quite, I mean, maybe he, you know what? I think that he would drive right into a black hole to spook <laughs> just, a bureaucrat. Just a spooker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could see that happening. That's an old school move. Yeah. There's a real... Uh, a, ma a maverick move? Uh, yes, a maverick move. Uh, or a goose <laughs> move. Uh, either way. Um, there's a real... Um, uh, there's a real undercurrent of gaming in the episode. I don't know if you, you caught that or felt that. Um, the idea that um, Boimler, who, as you know, we've talked about this on uh, pr past weeks, is just showing more and more... Um, just agency and like ability in his, in his duties. And so he breezes through this Borg yeah. thing and he gets like a 70 something and he's like, I can do that better. And he goes back and does it again. And it reminded me of like uh, playing a video game where you get a certain score or you're trying to get like a hundred percent completion and going back and, and playing it over and over again. Um, do you think that you would be able to teach the Borg queen empathy? <laughs> that's that's got to be like a bonus objective or something like that. Yeah, that would that seems like that would be difficult. That's like that's what you have to get one hundred percent on the you know on the on the Starfleet simulator is beat the Borg Queen at chess. Right. Don't just Queen uh, Gambit type beat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't just uh, disintegrate her with uh, with uh, plasma backwash or whatever. But yeah, like you know, get get her to sit down and be like, you know, tell me about you going on with the board queen <laughs> i know you have feelings in there somewhere although uh even they when might you, be assimilated but that's okay yeah even when you teach her to relate to other beings uh, she can just uh, assimilate that ability do you think you would pass the test could you ride a horse oh i've ridden a horse i don't know I'm not, i don't think i'm like a virtuoso but um <laughs> It seems like, uh, I don't know, I feel like Mariner, you know, it's probably not a, a good horse rider as, as she seems to think she is. Uh, but maybe that, you know, like she said, maybe the, the sim was tampered with. Could be. Could have been messing with her. Um, when, when she said the horses were, when she was like, oh, the horse, no, that was real. You're just bad. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about Boimler. Um, do you, do you want to, uh, revisit our, uh, tinfoil hat theory about, uh, Boimler, this Boimler being a different Boimler or, uh, I can't even remember what our theory is. It has so many arms. Honestly. Yes. And I, you're in my head because the second that we hit the mirror universe and I saw mirror universe Boimler, I was like, please, she can't fall for mirror universe Boimler in a <laughs> tiny holodeck. I'll lose my mind. <laughs> Yeah, alas, that was not to be. But there was a there was a quick little blip uh, in the um, in the Borg simulation when they've they've captured him and she's um, like they're scanning him, they're getting ready to Borgify him, and she says something about like him not being human. He's like, no, no, I, I'm I'm human. And she's like, oh, oh, and they make a joke about how like he he looks like crap or whatever, so he's not human. But I was he's wondering if water. that was if that was a tip towards 
Uh, maybe he is not, you know, he's a cloned human or there's something different about him. That's so funny. I didn't even think about that in that way. Do you think, I guess next week's the finale, right? So if it was, if we're going to find out, we'll find out next week. Well, there's, there's, uh, or do they, uh, is it next week? There's, there's uh, two more episodes. Maybe do, they, do they both play next week? I guess I should know. I don't think Probably so. Probably not, and I'm just remembering incorrectly. Yeah, I, I think the 14th is okay. uh, when the last two more weeks. Airs. Uh, I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, finally, we'll know. I can't <laughs> do this anymore. Oh, you don't have to wait that long, but yeah. I kind of wonder if I don't know. I honestly don't know. Yeah, it's you know I don't think that they these are all pretty standalone, and I don't think that they really. Um, try to they'll introduce something at the beginning of the uh, season and then they'll kind of bring it back at the end and that pretty much fits with you know classic star trek but Mm -hmm. i kind of wish that they would use uh the their opportunity to maybe goose us a little more because if this is an example of them trying to put that into our minds or kind of refer back to that it doesn't do much you know what i mean i mean unless unless i brought it up you you would have totally missed it and so yeah well that's what I was going to say is I was going to be like, if, if they were going to do that, this is the clone. Yeah. I feel like I would have needed one or two more hints previous to this episode. Yeah. To, like, to build the suspense. Yeah. I, I'm not really sure what they would do like with, with like an ongoing storyline. I mean, definitely don't do the thing like they did on Voyager where there was, they have the traitor and like just there's one scene every episode where he's talking to the Kazons. He's like, no, I don't think they found me out yet. Mm-hmm. Like that doesn't really add anything. <laughs> But, um, yeah, but just letting us know, like, that there is a shoe in the air that's going to drop at some point, like, giving us um, giving us the cues to sort of, like, look for clues and, and try to figure out if something's going to happen. I guess we're doing that on our own, but we're, we're very studious uh, fans. Yeah. I don't know. It could go either way. It could be that it's the funny thing that we come back to every once in a while where it's like, oh, there's the clone is, you know, badass and he, there he is on the bridge with Riker. Or it could be that next week and the week after we, we maybe, you know, maybe next week we get the hints. Maybe this is our first one. We get our, our second and third next week. I don't know. Yeah. Does he, does the clone have all of his memories? I guess. Yeah, Must. I think so. Yeah. Cause it's just a transporter clone, right? Yeah, so it would, it's like literally a copy. Like he wouldn't be like, oh my God, pesto, because he's had pesto. <laughs> yeah, right. If he's, yeah, if he's had it, um, he would remember all the, all the captain's logs that he's, uh, that he's read and have all that yeah. information still. Yeah. Yeah. Like worst case scenario, there's something wrong with him. Like because he's a, he's like a broken transporter copy and then one of them melts or something like that. And we have to say goodbye in that way. He glitches. Once, yeah. once you create a, a duplicate, you kind of are responsible for that duplicate. It's like a child, really. And um, there's, um, there's a funny series on Hulu, uh, the Modoc series, the Marvel series. Um, slight spoilers for near the end of the season, but at one point, like his, he has two kids, and one of them gets duplicated, and they're like, "Oh no!" But it turns out that like that's kind of what his kid always wanted. Like his kid is like a weird kid, but now he has like a weird twin and friend. And so one of them is a robot, but they don't really care. They just raise them both like they're their kids. Uh Yeah, it's cute. So I, I certainly hope that like, but we, you know, both Boimlers turn out okay. Then one doesn't join the Maquis and become How do we, a terrorist. Is there, is there um, like lore for telling the difference between a transporter clone oh, oh, it's Star- and, the, and, and the first person? <laughs> it's Star Trek. They've got all kinds of ways to tell that, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't want him to like... Summon the blood. Yeah, to steal the Defiant and then, you know, he rips off his quiff and he's bald underneath and he's a Maquis guy or something. <laughs> we don't want that. We've done that. Uh, mm-hmm. anything else you can think of for this episode? I excretus. Um, I don't think so. Although I, the hardest I've laughed so far this season, I think was when he <laughs> from behind the door, all dejected is like, there is no Boimler. It is I excretus. Of yeah. Board. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That cracked me up. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it, it turns into like a super happy like ending where they get ice cream or whatever and everything's great. But then he's still kind of like, oh, I took everything I was. 
Oh, man. I kind of wonder what the, I mean, it's a, you know, comedy show. It's a joke, obviously. But I wonder what the, if you're in a Borg simulation and you get assimilated, like, you know, apparently you don't just get tapped, like you're out and then you go sit somewhere. Like you have to go through the process <laughs> of being assimilated and get holographic implants. And yeah, you really don't want to fail that Do you test. think that you feel like, do you think that it was, you think that the simulation is complete with like the pain you'd feel, I'm assuming, of being assimilated? I've like, always, do you think he really went through it? That's a great question. I've always wondered that. Like, when, well, actually, I was going to say Worf, but let's leave Worf out of this. If a normal person goes and does combat training with Skeletor, like, it's non lethal, right? Mm-hmm. And so when he hits you with the, the Batleth because you miss the block, it gives you like a, a shock or like a stun or something. And it's probably like something that's painful, but not <gasps> debilitating, right? Um, although Worf that would be so cool. Yeah. Worf is always, he's doing it safeties off though all the time. It'd be like, um, like training a dog. Like, you know, when you get those invisible oh, no. fences or something no, for a dog. No. Yeah. Imagine how good, imagine how good of, uh, like a batless warrior Boimler could be if you just put a shock collar on him and shocked him every <laughs> yeah. time he messed up. Well, um, I hope to see that in season three. <laughs> <laughs> oh well i think that's gonna do it for our show this week mm-hmm. uh thanks for joining us listeners if you like what you hear you can follow us on facebook and twitter at eist pod for updates and to get notified when new episodes of both enterprising individuals and discoverage are released and you can tweet to us on the show by using the hashtag discoverage or email us at EISTpod at gmail.com. And while you're on the internet, why not head to your listening platform of choice and subscribe to our show feed. Give us a rating and a review because it really helps us out. And if you want to help the show grow, you can stop by our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash EISTpod. And as always, if you like the show, tell a friend. Discovery will return on October 7th for the ninth episode of Season 2 of Star Trek Lower Decks. And again, we do not know the title of the episode, really anything, as we get closer to the end of the season here. No information, but we will be here next Thursday to cover it. We'll be going live once again at 8 p.m. Central, so join us then. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook at EISTpod to get notified when we're live and broadcasting. But in the meantime, check out our main show, Enterprising Individuals, at enterprisingindividuals.com. Every Wednesday on the show, I and a special guest discuss in excruciating detail a selected episode from a Star Trek series. We also have news from the Trek Sphere and interviews with special guests. Our latest episode just dropped, and on it, I'm joined once again by Darren Mooney of The Escapist to talk about not Star Trek, mostly. Darren is a critic and a writer on all things pop culture, so I took the opportunity to pick his brain about recent non-Star Trek releases like Shang-Chi, the new Evangelion movie, Uh, we do some Doctor Who talk, and more. You can hear that episode at enterprisingindividuals.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Ella, thanks as always for joining me to talk about tonight's episode of Lower Decks and remind the people where they can find you online. Thank you. Um, My home podcast is called Generations Geek. I do it with my dad and we have a brand new Sherlock Holmes episode up um, that everyone should go take a listen to. Yeah, uh, not heard it yet, but I'm definitely going to listen soon. And um, (laughs) were you a fan of the uh, Stephen Moffat uh, Sherlock on the BBC? Um, I was. I feel like I think as many people, you know, the later seasons got a little rocky, but when yeah. that show was airing, I it was like it was just a sweet spot for me where I was like a, a teenager and I was like, this is the best show that's yeah. ever been made. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I rewatch it afraid that it's going to be like bad now that I'm watching it again as like a young adult. And you know what? I still enjoy it. I love yeah. it a lot. A ready-made fandom just for me. Did you end up uh, watching the the Dracula show? Uh, No, I didn't. Did you? No, I didn't either. Um, I heard it was bad. (laughs) And I was also uh, kind of frustrated with Stephen Moffat because of the end of Sherlock and Doctor Who. But I am uh, probably going (laughs) to probably double back and check it out at some point. Someday. Someday. And then we can get Sherlock Mm -hmm. and uh, Dracula together. Or against against each other, of course, versus. That's the dream. That is the dream that we're all working for. Well, that is it for us. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Oh, I should say that you can find me on uh, Twitter at K-A-1-I-B-A-N and all the shows on the Just Enough Trope Network at, at Just Enough Trope on Twitter. And that is it for us. Thanks for listening. We're signing off. This is Aaron Fraella saying live long and prosper. Mm-hmm.